G'day everyone, how are you going? Today is the 31st of August, so they say, uh, 2024. Okay, so I'm going to share a slight history of money and, and what our perception of money is and is not. <laughs> and it's deep, man. I've found a lot of things that you should be interested in. Perhaps not. I don't know. So, hang around. Um... The history of money, warlord, banksters, and the worship of mammon. Half of the warlord banksters is complex and has been hidden by obfuscation, deceit, and subterfuge to obscure the truth and protect a small group of banking families whose scams have fleeced every nation on earth, hidden the loot from offsh in offshore tax havens that hold the stolen wealth of the world. These elite banking families own and the controlling interest in the Fortune 500 companies through asset management companies shill companies, offshore companies, and thousands of other old banking tricks that have been used since the time of King Hembry of Babylon. The Italian, Jewish, German, and Lombard bankers of Venice used the same old tricks, the father of lies, to create privately owned central banking systems that are used to this day in most countries and are still owned by the self-aggregating banking families. Greed, known as the evil demon Memon, hasn't changed his ways since the cutthroat Machines of the Mercedes bankers laid down the principles of the corporate wardle of banking that they are inherently immoral and work against the human advancement by engineering war, predatory banking and economic slavery. Ultimately, these usury bankers convince governments to lock people up for not paying back loans on time. Debitors' prison was the outcropping of the banking firms, later called merchant bankers, controlling governments and economies that reach beyond the national limitations as commerce, trade and mercantilism took over the world. Bankers continue to have the upper hand and indeed made and destroyed kings, kingdoms with loans from their banking families. These families became corporate lineages that are still in power throughout the world today. Associate them through the Pilgrim Society, the World Economic Forum, IMF, World Bank, BIS and many secret cabals. Like the Vatican, the British Knights of Malta, CRF, which is Council of Foreign Relations, RAF, RIA, and the United Nations, and many other elite globalist groups. The inventors of the bank fraud and the demise of the Babylon, the money was first developed in the ancient world in temples that kept track of storage of grain and food for the next season, which was initially a good and moral intention that changed no service, charged no service fee or interest. Coins and money were developed to represent the value of human labor and stored resources. Eventually, temples began to use their excess grain stores and hard corns, coins to make loans and other investments. This money was used for the benefit of the group, not the personal gain of the individual. When the control of the money left the domain of the temple, the positive uses for surplus grain coin were taken to the dark side. Demons began fighting with the gods of the temple for the control of the money and the lives of the people. Until we have the full picture of the evolution of money, mammon, we will be unconsciously subject to these powerful dynamic forces that are controlling our personal and global economic lives. And this is a spiritual war that has been going on for a long time. It's massive. It's a war for your soul. So, the story of the money in the Western world begins around 2000 BC when the Babylonians had evolved into a highly developed commercialized society, complete with sophisticated monetary and creditory system. Barley and silver functioned side by side in a dual monetary system that made use of both of those mediums of exchange and standards of value. Historically, barley preceded silver as a chief form of currency. A legal ratio establishment, the value of silver in terms of the barley and vice versa. Creditors accepted payments in either silver or barley depending on the debtor's present preference. Silver grew in importance relative to barley and later Babylonian gold became a complete middle completing competing middle currency. The code of Hammurabi. So 2123 to 2108 BC. So today's Hebrew date is 5784, right? So this must have happened 3661 years ago is when all this was going on, okay? So the code of grain money for certain pat Payments and medals for others. Merchants who insist upon payment in the wrong currency could face severe penalties. The standard monetary unit was a shekel, equal to 180 grains of barley, or a fixed weight of silver. The silver was melted into small ingots that circulated as money, and was usually tested for fineness at each transaction. Some of those ingots bore the image of a superstition of a god whose temple guaranteed the fineness of the silver. The temple lent goods 
from their stores for repayment and kind as a general practice the loans charged no interest as long as they were repaid on time some merchants carried on banking businesses of sorts making loans in silver and grain and holding deposits of customers that earned interest these customers could pay obligations by writing drafts on these deposits the statutory rate of interest was 20 percent but silver loans often earned 25 percent and grain loans more than 33 percent hmm there's that number bills of exchange were carved in clay tables it is believed that the traders began making their own shekels in order to avoid the time-consuming process of waiting each transaction. Merchants who issued their own shekels could then trade them to patrons as IOUs. Any returning customers could then trade the marked shekel for a quality of goods or services. The merchant would know their, their standard weight secured in the payment, and this method equally eventually developed into coinage system, where rulers' states developed their own sovereign currency as a standard for exchange. So, the Babylonian banking. Since land was such an essential part of Babylonian life, Babylonian firms at the time were heavily involved in the real estate matters. Banking firms like the House of Ilby acted as land managers, renting fields and absentee landlords, while other firms dealt strictly with royal-owned lands. For example, the House of Meshurai, operating in the last half of the 5th century BC, became successful by renting royal lands to tenant farmers and acting as agents in converting agricultural profits into metal. With prosperity come merchant bankers and a large sector of the population participating in commercial and financial operations whose transactions were based on silver standard and the model on a promising note. Contracts were written including a notarization by a witness with the location and the date the goods could be weighed in silver and total for an amount payable which would be loaned to the purchaser. The creditor would break the promissory clay tablet. Private Babylonian banks also supported venture capitalists seeking commercial enterprises. As a group of investors would pool their resources and give their capital to an individual to carry out the commercial transactions to make a profit that would be divided along the initial investors. Thus, the model for corporations came into being. In Babylon, at the time of Hemembri, there are records of loans being made to the by the priests of the temple. The temples took in donations and tax revenue and amassed the great wealth. They redistributed these goods to people in need, such as widows, orphans, and the poor, allowed people to take interest bearing loads. These loans were made at reduced below market interest rates. Sometimes arrangements were made to make the food donations to the temple instead of repaying interest. Once these systems of usury were established in the grip of Memon was creating a cultural transformation based upon money. People naturally fell into debit and become slaves to pay off the debt. The debit had become imprisoned for debt, could nominate his wife, child, slave to work off the debt. The situation got so out of hand that King Hammerite decreed that no one could be enslaved for more, more than three years for a debt. Other cities, with residents racked by debt, issued moratoriums on all outstanding bills. The worship of Mammon was taking hold of the cultures that embraced usury and focused on money that makes money not from labour, evil usury. During the 5th century BC, warlord banking families came into existence in the Babylonian in their initial form in the House of Ilbi, Mashere, can't say that, sorry, and Borsapi. With such banking families, these banksters were classified as merchant bankers but should be seen as worshippers of mammon who turned to culture significantly towards materialism and belief in greed and harm killed many people in the process. Mammon, the devil behind the money, you know, the root of all evil. Memon in the New Testament of the Bible is commonly thought to be money, material, wealth, or an, any entity or devil that promises wealth and is associated with the greedy pursuit of personal gain and self gratitude. In the Middle Ages, Memon was often, often personified as a demon and sometimes included in the seven princes of hell who govern the seven deadly sins. Memon in Hebrew means money and is the god of material things, essentially the materialism of our time that seems to control most Westerners. The seven deadly sins lead to hell, and Mammon is seen as one of the most powerful demons who hurts humanity on the paths of perdition. The seven deadly sins and their accompanying demons are often listed as Lucifer, pride, Mammon, greed, as most, most, as modus, lust, Leviathan, envy, Bezelbub, gluttony, Satan, wrath, Belkufa, sloth. The word Mammon can denote wealth or profit in the original Syriac dialect, but it also is the name of a Syrian deity who was the god of riches. The Mishiach Hebrew word memon means money, wealth, possessions, and that in one which trusts. So in God that we trust, you know, the one that they have. So when they have this on the money and in the God we trust, that's not, you know, the God of Jesus. It's um, a different God. It's a demon. It's a demigod, Satan. <laughs> 
Eventually, due to the Christian injunction against charging interest for money that is loaned to another person, usury, the entire idea of money, mammon, became a perichivo, a term that was used to describe pride, greed, gluttony, excessive materialism, and an unjust worldly gain. The worship of money was seen as a sin and the work of a demon of greed, mammon. Later, money becomes synonymous with the hellish intent and bondage to the physical world which leads humans into the dark realms. Therefore, Christians were warned to stay away from practices of usury and the glorification of mammon. It was common belief that usury is the work of the devil and it certainly not fit for a Christian. Christians should be faithful with another and help them out of love, not for purpose of money, mongering or for personal wealth gain. The Christian is careful not to be contaminated by the unrighteousness of wealth and the money and the lure of mammon. The appearance of the demon of money and greed can be, has changed over time. Mammon is now a card, a credit or a pin in your bank account. Check, cash, bitcoin, direct deposit or a direct debit credit to your account digitally. That materialism that created mammon is so ingrained into Westerners that it is subconscious background noise that is seldom noticed. Mammon rules the human willpower through tax, debit, slavery, technological assets on human lifestyles, and the control of human addictions. The seven deadly sins are found in most Hollywood productions. And the path to hell is like a red carpet rolled out for the warlord bankers and brokers who lavish themselves in their pride of their greed, gluttony, lust, hatred, and war. Mammon is a global big business, and the banking families aren't giving up any money without good returns on their investment. One owner's usury and global control of flow of money. It is probably fair to say that most Westerners are either overwhelmed with the system of mammon or are blissfully ignorant and wallowing in their pigsty of materialism. <laughs> it's true. It is comfortable and mud hole with its scraps and in the bankster elites to please the middle aged, middle class Pele. Since Westerners have little understanding on the true history of the world, there is little or no understanding on the economic control that got us into the current insane economically controlled world where America owes banking families $25 trillion in debt through the US Federal Reserve, which creates continuous, onerous debt that can never be paid off. Ever rising debt, that the usual method that banksters, economic gangsters, used to control the entire country through war debt, wars that warmongering banksters often help to create. So the warlord bankers. Well, the first modern bank was established in Venice with a guarantee from the state in 1157 AD, operated until 1797, acting at the interest of the Crusades of the Pope Urban II. This activity developed into the Bank of Venice with initial capital of five ducats, ducats, uh, ducats, ducats. This bank was the first national bank to be established within boundaries of Europe. In the middle of the 13th century, when rich Italian families saw the profits that the Venetian banking families were making, groups of Italian Christians, particularly the Carlsons and Lombards, invented legal fictions to get around the ban on the Christian usury. One method of Christians affecting a loan with interest without calling it usury was to offer money without interest. But it also requires that the loan is insured against the possible loss of injury and delays of repayment. The Christians affecting these legal fictions become known as the Pope's Ursus and reduce the importance of the Venetian and Italian Jews to European monarchs. Hmm. So what they did is they bought this in and you got the bird, two birth certificates, you know, the sovereign citizen stuff. You know, you got your corporate fiction and all that. They go on about us. Uh, Store man and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, in the United States, it's known as a corporation. It's it's not known as a republic. Um, Australia is similar. So this is what was done to take away their legal responsibilities. You know. Christians affecting these legal fictions become known as the Pope's usurers and reduce the importance of the nation. I you, yeah, I read that. The most powerful Italian warlord banking families come from Florence, including the Fami, all of these, which established branches throughout Europe. Probably the most famous Italian bank was the Mercedi Bank, set up by, by in 1397 and continuing until 1494. The spread of Italian bankers into Europe was dramatic by 1327. If you go on France, had 43 branches of Italian banking house accompanying the growth of Italian banking in France was the start of the Lombard money changes on Europe, who moved from city to city along the busy pilgrim routes, important for trade. By the later Middle Ages, Christian merchants who lent money with interest were without opposition, and the Jews lost their privileged position as money lenders. After 1400, political forces turned against the methods of the Italian free enterprise bankers, and 1404, 
1401, King Martin I of Arga, had some of these bankers expelled in 1403, King Henry of England prohibited them from taking profits in any way from his kingdom in 1409. Flanders imprisoned and then expelled Genese bankers by in 1410. Italian merchants were expelled from Paris. Later, when modern banking practices became widespread, the Italian banking families become prominent again, especially in 1527 and 1572, when Italy produced a number of important banking family groups. Body. All these families Banks, along with other large banks in Florence and Siena in particular, were all founded in the years around 1250 and 1290. They grew dramatically in size and reputationness. They were reorganised by the influx of new partners. These were the Black Guruoff noble families of the factions of the northern Italian landed aristocrats. Were always bitterly hostile to the government of the Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne, 500 years earlier, had already recognised Venice as a threat to equal to the Vikings and had organised a boycott to try and bring Venice to terms with his empire. Venice in the 1300s was the centre of the Black Guru fiction, faction which drove Dante and his co-thinkers from Florence. Machiavelli's Machiavelli described how in 1308 the Black Guru Lof ruled everywhere in northern Italy except in Milan which reigned allied with the Holy Roman Empire and was the most economically developed and powerful city-state in the 14th century Italy. The charter of the Parte Gruffa openly claimed that it was the party of the papacy and with Venice the Black Guru openly pushed for the popes to change usury from a mortal sin to a venial sin. The Venetians seemed to enjoy an effective exemption from the Catholic Pope's injunctions against usury and also from their ban on trading with infidels and the Soyak and the Malmonarch regions of Egypt and Syria, so they'd be with the Muslims. A century earlier in the 1180s, Dodge Duke Zani of Venice had Emperor Frederick give agree to withdraw his standard of silver coinage from Italy and allow Italian cities to mint their own coins. Over the century from 1183, Peace of Constance in the 1290s, Venice established the extraordinary near total dominance of trading in gold, silver and coin billion throughout Europe and Asia. Whew. And that's the Phoenicians, you know. The Black Guru of Bankers of Florence did not simply loan money to the monarchs and then expect repayment with interest because interest was of not often officially not charged on the loan since usury was considered a sin and a crime among Christians. The prime condition was like pledging of the royal revenues directly to the banks. The clearest sign that the monarchs lacked national sovereignty against the black girl of privateers since the 14th century, Europe imported commodities like food, wool, clothing, salt, iron, etc. were produced only under royal license and taxation. Bank control of the royal revenue led to first, private monopolization of the production of these commodities and second, the bank's privatization control of these future royal functions of the royal government itself. By 1325, this bank owned all the revenues of the Kingdom of Naples, the entire southern half of Italy, the most productive grain belt in the entire Mediterranean era. They recruited and ran King Robert Naples' army, collected his duties and taxes, appointed the officials of his government, and above everything, sold the grain from his kingdom. They egged on Robert to continue wars, to conquer Sicily, but because through Spain, Sicily was allied with the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, thus Sicily's grain production, with the Presuni did not control, was reduced by war. King Robert enjoys Robert Rotello. King Robert enjoys re relatives, the kings of Hungary, had their realms similarly privatized by the Florence banks in the same period. In France, the Perusies were the cooperating bank of the bankers to King Philip. The Bardi and the Perusie banks privatized the revenues of Edward II and Edward III of England, paid the king's budget, monopolized the sale of English wood. When the king ever tried forbidding Italian merchants and banks from expirating their expatriating their profits from England, they converted their profits into wool and stored huge amounts of wool at the monasteries in order of the Knights of Hospitalers, who were their debitors, political allies and partners in the monopolization of the wool trade. Ha, that sounds familiar. It is the Bardi's representatives who proposed to Edward III the wool by court, which destroyed the textile industry of Flanders. Ah, oh. and you know, they still do that today, you know? Wow. Large revenue flows come back to the Venetian in the collection of its church contributors and tithes under John the Black Girl of Pope from 1316 to 1336. Papal tithes skyrocketed, reaching the apparent value of 250,000 gold florins per year. Whew. All were collected by agents of the Venetian banks. For France, the largest source of papal revenue and the Barkity Bank. For everywhere else in Europe except Germany, they ex charged the Venetian Vatican 
sizable exchange fees to transfer collections. Only Venice allied banks had the reserves of cash to finance papal operations. They transferred the collections from Europe and loaned them to the popes in advance. Thus, Venice controlled the papal credit and continued hostilities between the papacy and the Holy Roman Empires. In the Italian city-states themselves, the early years of the 14th century saw the assignment of more and more of the revenues of the primary taxes to the bankers of the Gruwolf Party. But it holds from about 1315, the Gruwolf established their income taxes in the city, but increased them on the surrounding rural areas. From about 1315, the Gruwolf abolished the income taxes in the city, but increased them in the surrounding rural areas into which they expanded their authority. The bankers, merchants, and the wealthy grew up aristocrats did not pay taxes, but instead they made loans to city and governments. That still goes on today. <laughs> That's still happening. You know, we see it in Australia. The bankers lend the farmers the money. They're in drought, can't buy feed. They keep buying feed, they keep buying feed on credit. You know, the drought keeps going. Then they can't pay the loan. The bank comes in and takes the land. Then a corporation comes in and buys the farm. Like, that still happens today. <laughs> None of these big banks or farm companies pay tax. You know, Facebook pays no tax in Australia. They don't pay for any of their news source. Like, some of the famous banks in Tuscany had already failed in the 1320s. The Asti Asina, the Frenzy, the Sely Company of Florence in 1330s, the biggest banks with the exception of... These were losing money and plunging towards bankruptcy with the fall of production of the vital commodities which they had monopolised. All of these guys, who were the bankers of the Vatican before it left Rome, went bankrupt in 1342 with the default of the city of Florence and the first defaults of Edward III. The privacy in the body. The world's two largest banks went under in 1345, leaving the entire financial market of Europe and the Mediterranean shattered with the exception of much smaller Hessianetic League bankers of Germany who had never allowed the Italian banks and the merchant companies to enter their city. Doesn't that just sound like, you know, their, their exchange of wealth, like that happened during lockdowns and stuff that happens today? Like, we can't buy gas in Australia at a cheap price because the gas companies have a contract with the government and they basically get to pump the gas for free. They pay the government a small fee. It's not much, but... and um, the government promises them a certain amount each year at that price and it's capped and the public is not allowed to have any of that gas. They get a certain amount and if the public runs out, you know, they've got to charge the public at a higher rate of, for that gas or electricity. You know, it's just ridiculous. Still happens today. Venice, the world's mint. Between 1250 and 1350, Venetian financiers built up the worldwide financial speculation in currencies on gold, silver, bullion, and this ultimately dwarfed and controlled the speculation in debit, commodities, and trade in. The Bari, the Peruzzi, and other banking families took all control of coinage and currency from the monarchs of the time. Venetian financial oligarchy as a whole, which ruled the Maritime Empire through a small executive committees under the guise of a republic, centralised and supported its own speculative activities as a whole. Hmm. The republic built the ships and auctioned them to the merchants, huh. escorted them with large, well-armed navy convoys of their empire with navy commanders responsible to the Venetian Committee of Ten and magistrates for the convoys of safety. The same oligarchy many maintained several public mints and did everything possible to foster the centralisation of gold and silver trainage and coining in Venice, which was the dominant trade of Venice by 1310. <laughs> the Venetian bankers and bullion dealers were backed by large pools of capital and pr protection that worked out for the Cathedral of San Macros grain office and the procurers of the San Macros who controlled the collection of taxes of the Republic. The size of the, size of the Venetian bullion trade was huge. Twice a year, bullion fleet of up to 20 or 30 ships under huge navy control sailed from Venice to the eastern Mediterranean coast or Egypt, bearing primarily silver and sailed back to Venice bearing mainly gold, including all kinds of coinage, bars, leaf, etc. The profits of this trade put usury to shame. Huh. That's, you know, like that's sweat off the people's back, you know, like locking people up for debt, you know. That's putting a price on something that's, you know, of no value, like the Christian Crusades, the first in 1099, the seventh and the ma last major one in 1291, had only one strategic effect: expanding and strengthening the maritime commercial empire of Venice to the east. Huh. Yeah, okay. Venice provided the ships to take the Crusaders to the Middle East. Venice loaned them the money. Ven Venetian dodgers often told them what cities to try and capture or sack. 
through the Crusades, Venice gained effective control of the cities of Tyre, Sidon and Acre in Lebanon, and Leza and Turkey and strengthened its domination of the command through the Constantinople. These were the coastal entry points through the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea regions to China and India. And the silk trade. The strategic, the strategic alliance between Venice and the Mongol Khan gave Venice a huge amount of gold with which to dominate world currency trading for decades. Mongol middlemen met Venetian merchants and the Mongol ruled Persian trading cities of Tibet, Tibetoid and Taina trading gold for silver from Europe. Large-scale trade and slaves and Mongol domains were associated with the current, current trade. The Venetians were able to raise the price of silver despite the existence of record quantities coming to Venice from Europe. The Crusades also consolidated the alliance of Venice and its allied Black Gulf ruled cities, the Papacy and the Norman and the Andrew kings against the Holy Roman Empire centred in Germany. Aha. Uh -huh. uh. Yeah. Why do you think they had an East and a West Germany? Just to get the Protestants. In the latest... The 13th and 14th century, Venice provided all the coinage and currency exchange for the largest empire in history, which was looting and destroying the populations under its rule. Venice had taken over the currency trading and coining of what remained in the Byzantine Empire. See, I think that the Roman Empire is actually the Byzantine Empire, and the Roman Empire is just a made-up fiction to cover that thousand years. Venice took over Europe took the east off the gold standard and put them on the silver standard, took Byzantine and Europe off a 500-year-old silver standard and put them on gold standard. Ah, oh, didn't know that. They don't teach you this at school. The Venetian finances and merchants were making annual rates of profit of up to 40% on very large, overwhelmingly short-term, six-month investments. Venice and Snart are all the surrounding economies, including Germany economy, where production of silver, iron, and iron implements were concentrated. By the 1320s, Venetian merchants no longer travelled to Germany to trade. They compelled German producers and merchants to come to Venice and take up lodgings in the warehouses of the Germans, where their goods would be stored for sale. Venetian bankers on the Rialto, the Banco, Banco, Del Banco, made cashless bank transfers among merchants' accounts. <laughs> Allowed overdrafts, gave credit lines on the spot, created bank money, and then speculated with it. They do that today. <laughs> they did this out of the internet simply we were controlling currency speculation worldwide, <laughs> Wall Street, because they controlled the currency and they had the reserves to back it up. Yep, still going on today. The Rialto bankers charged fees to those involved in the trade before, because exchanging currencies might not be involved in a transaction. These exchange fees were taken out of the pr production and the trade costs. Hurt profits, while the usury profits made bankers ever richer. Then the bankers made the bills of exchange even more extensive even more expensive to hedge against their own potential losses in currency fluctuations being manipulated by Venetian billion merchants. Thus, bills of exchange in the 14th century cost 40% on average, worse than borrowing money at the set interest. Well, ultimately, the real Alto de Bancos always gained more wealth from every deal until, of course, they went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, the Ponzi schemes. Venice switched Europe to gold by looting silver. England, for example, from 1300s to 1309, imported 90,000 pounds of sterling silver in clo silver for coining. But from 1330 to 1339, it was only able to import 1,000 pounds. Whoa. But in Venice, there was no lack of silver at all in the 1300s. The Florence bankers, with their famous gold florin, enjoyed a speculative, speculative product profits in this currency scam. After the 1400, political forces turned against the methods of the Italian free enterprise merchant bankers. In 1401, King Martin I of Argonne, Spain, expelled them. 1403, Henry of England prohibited them from taking profits in any way in his kingdom. In 1404, Flanders imprisoned and then expelled the Guinea bankers. In 1410, the Italian merchants were expelled from Paris. When Louis became king in France in 1460. One, he organised national forces to make it the first strong and sovereign nation state, along with the development of ports, roads and support for its cities. Lewis insisted on single standard national currency created and controlled by the crown for both Lewis and England's Henrys. In the same period, uh, merciless forms of economic nationalism were combined with a pr pronounced hostility, hostility to Italian techniques of credit and clearing. So, what made me make this video? Well, the video I was talking about with Alan the other day, I was thinking about it. There was something that went on in 1828 to 1839, 
and there was another massive worldwide depression that is hardly ever talked about. This worldwide depression was worse. So the Italian bankers flee to Germany. In Germany, we find many Italian banking families migrating to Hamburg and becoming the hidden money behind the Hessianetic League, an early trading company that used Spanish and Portuguese merchant sailors in the lucrative spice and slave trade. These early unions of rich bankers investing in trade become the basis for what become corporations like the Dutch and British East India companies and a model for the European Central Banks. In southern Germany, two great banking families emerged in the 15th century the Fugus and the Welsers. They basically came to control much of the European economy and dominated international high finance in the 16th century. The Fugger Bank lasted from 1486 to 1647 and Jacob the Rich Fugger, originally spelled fucker, <laughs> became the richest man in history. So Bill Gates isn't the richest man in history then, okay. Uh, you never believe anything they say anyway. It's also important in to the non-German cities States establishing powerful banks was the influence of Dutch bankers. Berenberg Bank was the oldest bank in Germany and the world's second oldest bank, established in 1590 by the Dutch brothers Hans and Paul Berenberg in Hamburg. The bank is still owned by the Berenberg banking family. Throughout the 17th century, precious metals from the New World, Japan, and other locals were being channeled into the banking of Amsterdam. Now, this New World, that's when the New World Order started. Okay, it's nothing new and, um, you're, you're already part of that system. Um, you're not going to get out of it. Your, your birth certificate bonds were created. And yeah. The Netherlands attracted a coin and bullion to be deposited into their banks until they become a leading force of banking. The concepts of fractional reserve banking and payment systems were developed to spread to Germany, England, and elsewhere from Holland. The city of London and the low London Royal Exchange was established in 1565, and by the end of the 16th century, during the 17th century, the traditional banking functions of accepting deposits, money lending, money changing, transferring funds were combined with the issuance of bank debit that served as a substitute for gold and silver coins. This would lead to government regulations um, and the first central banks in Europe. This, see, the success of the new banking techniques and practices in Amsterdam and London helped spread the concepts and ideas elsewhere in Europe. The convenience of modern banking was becoming such a way that the modern person couldn't really exist without a bank account. Thus, the grip of mammon becomes strong and yet more unconscious as banking practice entered daily life more and more. Modern banking. The original modern banks were merchant banks. The Italian grain merchants invented the Middle Ages. The Lombard merchants and bankers grew in stature based on the strength of the Lombard plain cereal crops. Many displaced Jews fleeing Spanish persecution were attracted to the trade of banking in Italy. Jews could not hold land in Italy, so they entered the great trading piazzas and halls of Lombardy alongside local traders and set up their benches, belcos, on trade to trade in crops. They had one great advantage over the local. The Christians were strictly forbidden to the sin of usury. Defined as lending at interest, the Jewish newcomers, on the other hand, could lend to farmers against crops in the field, a high-risk loan that would have been considered usurious rates by the church. But the Jews were not subject to the church dictates in this way. They could secure grain sale rights against the eventual harvest. Huh. Then they began to advance payment against the future delivery of grain shipped to the distant ports. Ha! <laughs> Still goes on today. <laughs> yeah. In both trades, they made their profit from the present discount against the future price. The two-handed trade was time-consuming, and soon there arose a class of merchants who were trading grain debit instead of grain. <laughs> a Jewish trader performed both financing credit and underwriting insurance functions. Financing took the form of a crop loan at the beginning of the growing season, which allowed the farmer to cultivate his annual crop. Underwriting in the form of the crop commodity insurance guaranteed the delivery of the crop to its buyer, typically the merchant wholesaler. Merchant banking progressed from the financing trade on one of its own behalfs to settle the trades for others and then to holding deposits for settlement as a billet or a note written on a people who were still brokering the actual grain. And so the merchant branches, Banco Bank, in the great grain markets become centers for holding money against the bill. These deposited funds intended to be held for the settlement of grain trades, but were often used for the branches' banks' own trades, in the meantime through loans with high interest rates. The broadening of the merchant bankers' powers caused an imbalance in the wealth that led the rich to look up 
lock up the poor and the bankers to turn the wheels of commerce into the gears of war. So, you know, we're sort of at this this at the moment because it's like a Ponzi scheme. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger until, you know, everyone's got nothing and that's where we're at now. In the 12th century, the need to transfer large sums of money to finance the Crusades stimulated the re-emergence of the banking in the Western Europe. In 1162, Henry II of Europe levied a tax to support the Crusades. The Templars, oh, the tax, you know, that's like Australia, 1924, they bought a tax in to, to support the war because um, World War I uh, just put Australia in debt and they had to bring a tax in. And they had to build Australia's navy up and army up. Mm same shit goes on so the templars and hostilers acted as henry's bankers in the holy land the templars large land holdings across europe also merged in the 1100s to 1300s time frame as the beginning of europe wide banking as their practices were taking in local currency for the demand note would be given and that would be good at any of their castles across europe and the levant which allowing movement of money without the usual risk of robbery while traveling now i heard when the crusades were going on they were using the tunnels of these forts and castles because most of these tunnel uh, castles and fort, forts do have tunnels they're all connected they are they're all built on ley lines they they all they used to have um in egypt they've got um underground tunnels for horse and carts and things like that they've got a big labyrinth under there massive and a train station even people got no idea you know like the world is very old and technology is not new like a lot has been the crusades become a platform for the merchant banking families to become warlord banking families who are still fermenting to war to this day so they might benefit by loaning money to both sides of the war to make a hands and profits then once the victor is known the warlord bankers set up a central banking system to create currency that enslaves the victims of the war to a debit that can never pay off the central banking system assures that the money of the country and the people becomes part of a larger system of memory worship the desires to have complete economic control of the world hegemony the ultimate control outcome of greed the timeline of the war world law banking families it is instructive to say instructive to have a glossary of the war law, lord banking families founders and early members to see that it is truly only a very few families that began the wholesale takeover of banking throughout the world to understand history we need a timeline of biographies not just dates timelines of historical events we need to know the usual culprits. Many places of the globalist puzzles fall into place. Below are some of the European bankers who spread to America and affected the US Federal Reserve with the same predatory banking practice that have been inspired by memon worship since ancient Babylon. You will recognize these, many of these bankers because their names come up as the money behind most of the conspiracy theories. Unfortunately, the City of London and its power is no conspiracy theory, and the warlord banking and the brokers who prey on the nations of personal gain still have the upper hand and maintain the economic slavery over most of the globe. So, the Vatican, before they left Rome and went bankrupt in 1342 with the default of the city of Florence, the first default of Edward III, the Prusy and the Browdy, the world's two largest bank, went under in 1345, leaving the entire financial market of Europe and the Mediterranean shattered, with the exception of the much smaller Hessianic lead bankers of Germany, who had never allowed the Italian banks and the merchant companies to enter their cities. Huh. That's why they were kicked out of every country. Jacob Fugger. 1459 to 1525, also known as Jacob Fogger, the rich and sometimes Jacob II, was a major merchant, mining entrepreneur, a banker of Europe. He was a descendant of the Fugger merchant family. He is considered to be the richest person in history. Uh, Francesco Zori, 1466 to 1540, was an Italian Francisco Friar, author of the work of Domahania. The Cambridge History of Renaissance Philosophy describes him as idiosyncratic. And his works embroidered in Italian banking families to dominate economic markets throughout Europe for centuries to justify their evil throughout the church's own philosophy. The Zori's influence cannot be overstated, as for he was quoted continuously by the Venetian school of central bankers who essentially came to central who essentially came to control central uh, European economies. Gestapo Contrani, 1483 to 1542, was an Italian diplomat, cardinal, bishop of Berlino. He was born in Venice of the ancient noble house of Contrani. Contrani is one of the founding families of Venice and one of the oldest families of the Italian nobility. In total, eight Dodge to the Republic of Venice emerged from this family, as well as 44 procurers, bankers of San Macro, numerous ambassadors, diplomats, other nobles, among the other ruling families of the Republic. They held most seats of the Great Council of Venice. And Anselmo Banco. Asher Levy, 
Mechelen. 1532 was considered the father of the Warburg family and was acknowledged as the head of the Jewish community in Venice. Owner of several loan banks of the Venetian territories, he took refuge in Venice, from which Jews had been here too excluded. When Prada was sacked by troops, the League of Carambari in 1509, from then on he acted as spokesman for the Venetian Jewry and was largely responsible for securing rights of residency and taxation. He represented the community also in 1516 when the Senate decided to establish a ghetto. He was also involved in the Jewish community of Jerusalem, sending money and helping those who sailed there from Venice. He corresponded with the famous Kabbalist Abraham Ahalevi of Jerusalem, on messianic subjects. The family members of the proprietors of one of the seven Venetian synagogues known as Sula Mishlam, some were of their descendants settled in Warburg and Hamburg and among the descendants of the Warburg family. Sir Horatio Palavinci 1540-1600 was the son of an Italian merchant who was recommended to Queen Mary and appointed collector of the papal taxes. He adjourned Romanism on Mary's death and appropriated the sums and collected for the Pope. He sent large sums of money to Queen Elizabeth as well as to the Netherlands and Henry of Navarre as well as noted by Queen Elizabeth I in 1579. His first son Sir Henry married Jane Cromwell while his other son Tobias married Catherine Cromwell. His daughter married Henry Cromwell, son of Oliver Cromwell. The power and influence of the Pamji banking family in England was extraordinary for hundreds of years and still has a tremendous influence as one of the richest, least known. Italian banking families still operated today. Paolo Sapri, 1552 to 1623, was an Italian historian, prelate scientist, canon lawyer and statesman, active on behalf of the Venetian Republic during the period of its successful defence of the papal indictment and its war with Austria. Austria. He was one of the first and the best propagandists. He published several pamphlets in defence of Venice's rights over the Adriatic and the spread of the Venetian central banking system as superior form of economics and government and rulers. Hans and Paul Berenberg joined the Berenberg Bank in Hamburg in 1590. Both brothers were Dutch refugees who joined the Hesiodic lead. Berenberg Bank was the oldest surviving merchant bank. The Berenberg Bank became the extinct in the male line with Elizabeth Berenberg. She was married to Jean Johan Heinrich Glosser, who became the co-owner of the bank in 1769. From the late 18th century, the Glosser family, as the owners of the Berenberg Bank, rose to great prominence in Hamburg and was widely considered Hamburg's most prominent families, two, the two most prominent families. Isa Char Bernard Lehmann, 1661 to 1730, was a German banker, merchant, diplomat, agent, as well as an army mint contractor working as a court Jew for Elector Augustus II, a strong of the Saxony, King of Poland, and other German princes. He was privileged as a court Jew and as well as a resident, thanks to his wealth, privilege, as well as social and cultural commitment. He was a Jewish dignitary famous in his day, central and eastern Europe. Now, Freemason, Freemasonry is, um, what, the way they say it, uh, Freemasonry is Judaism for Goyim. And, and this is how it's all spread. John Baker Esquire, 1707 to 1787, was the governor of the Crown, cheated Monopoly London Assurance Company, secretly provided the capital of prison, both the Continental and France armies, and then the capital to create the Bank of North America in 1781, the Bank of New York in 1784, and the first Bank of the United States in 1791, all with Alexander Hamilton's cooperation. Barclays is a British multinational universal bank, 1736, headquartered in London, England. Barclays operates two divisions, Barclays UK and Barclays International. Support by service company, Barclays Execution Service. Barclays traces its origins to Goldsmith Banking business established in the City of London in 1690. James Barclay became a partner in business in 1736. David and Alistair Barclay. Alexander Barclay were engaged in slave trade in 1756 and 1896. Several banks in London and the English provinces, including Gosling Banks, Bank Backhouse Bank and Gertie's Banks and Joint Stock Bank under the name of Barclays & Co. over the following years. Barclays expanded to become the international bank. Barclays has made numerous corporate acquisitions, including Lehman Brothers in 2008. Francis Baring, 1740-1810, was the director of the British East India Company. Founded Baring's Bank in 1783. Look at the date that person died. <sighs> His sister Elizabeth married John Dunning, who was a good friend of Lord Shilburne. Francis' son, Alexander, who married Anne Birmingham, the granddaughter of Thomas Willing, formed Sun Alliance Assurance with Nathan Meyer Rothschild in 1824. Oh, I'm getting close up. The Bearings were 
Barings were involved in the running of opium and slaves. The Barings owned a slave plantation and directed the British East India Company going through Francis Baring and the Bank of England through Alexandra Baring. Alexandra negotiated and financed the Louisiana package. Ah! Oh! The variance financed the annexation of Texas from Mexico and the purchase of Alaska from Russia. They financed Lincoln's ironclad ships and arms, essentially arms deals. Ultimately, HSBC was founded in 1866. Now, the Jews were in Russia, and uh, I dare say they got Russia um, before, before Jesus. I, you know, probably... I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe a little bit after he died, they got Russia, and they've they've been here there since. And some of them converted to Christianity. Some of them converted to Muslims, and they hid. Um, but see, that was all Jews hiding as Masons and doing backyard deals to make money and rob everyone. Mayor Amshel Rothschild, 1744-1812, was a German banker and a founder of the Rothschild Banking Dynasty, which is believed to have the wealthiest family in history. He ministry. He's often referred to as the founding father of the Rothschild Banking Dynasty. 550-year-old year Rothschild frauds discovered. Their offshore accounts must be seized to pay preparations, and that was in 15th of February 22. John Baker Church, 1748-1818, also known as John Carter, a British Crown agent handling and bank rolling Alexander Hamilton control of the first U.S. Bank's Bank of North America, first bank of the United States, the Manhattan Company. He also bankrolled the commissary of the Continental and the French armies. His uncle was John Baker, governor of the Crown Chartered London Insurance Company, the shipping insurance monopolist worldwide. And a slave owner of French origin, he personally saved the U.S. government from financial collapse during the War of 1812. He became one of the wealthiest people in America and is estimated to become the fourth richest American of all time. After the charter of the First Bank of the United States expired in 1811, Gurud purchased most of its stock and its facilities of the South 3rd Street in Philadelphia and re-established it under his direct personal ownership. Philadelphia banks balked at accepting the notes of Gurud issue on his personal credit and lobbied the state to force him to incorporate without success. Gurud's bank was principal source of government credit during the War of 1812. Now, this is important. Gary placed nearly all of his resources at the disposal of the government and underwrote up to 95% of the war loan. After the war, he became a large stockholder and one of the directors of the Second Bank of the United States. Gary's bank ceased operations upon his death. The Philadelphia businessman, eager to cash in on Gary's reputation, opened a bank called the Gary Trust Company, later the Gary Bank, and merged with Mellon Bank in 1983 and was largely sold to Citizens Bank two decades later. So this is important, and I'll share this article as well. I'll, I'll put it into a video, but it talks about here what happened and how it's happening currently and uh, how it's going to happen again. So I'll read this next. Alexandra Hamilton, 1755 to 1804, orchestrated British control of American banking from the inception of the Republic with Rothschild's financing. Hamilton founded two New York banks, including the Bank of New York. He died in a gun battle with Aaron Burr, who founded the Bank of Manhattan with Con Levin financing. Hamilton was the first in a series of banks to hold a key position of Treasury Secretary. In recent times, the Kennedy Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon come from the Dillon Road, USB. UBS Warburg, Nixon's Treasury Secretaries, David Kennedy and William Simon come from the Continental Illinois Bank, Bank of America, and the Selman Brothers, Citigroup, Carter Treasury Secretary Michael Bullum come from Goldman Sachs, Reagan Treasury Secretary Donald Reagan come from Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Bush Senior Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady come from Dylan Reed, USB Warburg, UBS Warburg, both Clinton Treasury Secretary Robert Ruman and Bush Jr. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson come from Goldman Sachs. Aaron Burr Jr., 1756 to 1836, was a British intelligence agent who became the U.S. Vice President, 1801 to 1805. Under Thomas Jefferson and co-founded the Manhattan Company with Alexandra Hamilton and John Baker Church, Burr shot and killed, murdered Hamilton in a duel on July 11, 1804. Wow. Um, Amschel Meyer Rothschild, 1773 to 1855, was a German Jewish banker of the Rothschild family, banking dynasty. He was the second child of the eldest son, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, the founder of the dynasty. Sam and Mayer Rothschild, 1744 to 1855, was a German born banker who founded an Austrian branch of the prominent family, Rothschild family in Vienna. 1820s established the Bank of S. M. von Rothschild. So that date, we're, we're in those dates again, you know. So we've got German Rothschild trying to manage the banking system of New York and America 
and you have another family that's also trying at the same time that has the backing of England. So there's, there's, there's just two different groups going at once. Nathan Mayer Rothschild was a German-English banker, businessman, financer, born in Frankfurt, Maine, Germany. He was the third of five sons of Mayer Amschel Rothschild. He was the second generation of the Rothschild banking dynasty. In 1798, Nathan was sent to England to further a family interest in textile importing with 20,000 in pound and capital, equivalent to 2.2 million pound. Nathan became a neutralized citizen in 1804 and established a bank in the city of London in um, Rothschilds and Son. Karl Mayer von Rothschild, 1788-1855, was a German-born banker in the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies and the founder of the Rothschild Banking Families of Naples. The Bank of North America, 1781, is today known as the Wells Fargo. Robert Morris was appointed by the Congress to be the first superintendent of the finance in 1781. Alexander Hamilton vied to be the superintendent and was overlooked. Morris successfully was successful in arranging for his British brother-in-law, John Baker Church, to become one of the bank's North America's two largest shareholders. While well, Church sailed into Europe to settle wartime accounts and visit his London base of operations, Churchill named Hamilton, his American business agent, in absent and deputised him to watch over his Bank of North America interests and establish the Bank of New York. So Moses Ham Munford, first baronet, 1784-1885, was a British financier and banker activist, Ferran, first sheriff of London, who was born to an Italian Sephardic Jewish family based in London. He was the president of the Board of Deputies of British Jew in 1812. Moses Montfire married Judith Cohen, daughter of Levy Baron Cohen. His sister Henriette married Nathan Marion Rothschild, for whom Montreux's form firm acted as stockbrokers. Nathan Rothschild headed the family's banking business in Britain, and the two brother in laws became business partners in business. Montfire was an innovator, investing in the supply of pipe gas for street lighting to European cities via the Imperial Continental Gas Association. In 1824, he was among the founding consortium of the Alliance Life Assurance Company, later Sun Alliance. John Henrik Schroeder, 1784-1883, founded Henry Schroeder & Co. in London, 1818. Henry Schroeder Banking Corporation, Schroeder Bank Co., was a commercial bank in New York, founded in 1923. Schroeder remained a British agent, evident by Schroeder's issuing £3 million bonds in 1863 for the Confederate Eventually, Schroeder's pick became a British multinational asset management company, which was founded in 1804. The company now employs over 5,000 people worldwide in 32 locations across Europe, America, Asia, Africa, Middle East, headquartered in the city of London. <laughs> Straight on the stock exchange and as a consult and the FTSE 100 index. The Schroeder family, through the trustee company's own individual ownership and charities, control 45% of the company's ordered shares. The Bank of New York, 1791, is today known as the BY. And Mellon. It was founded by a director Ham- Alexandra Hamilton and started with the deputization of Hamilton by his brother in law John Baker Church to start the bank with the church capital while he travelled to France and Britain to consolidate his fortune be made being the commissar and the continental f- of the French armies. Hamilton's control of the Bank of North America, the Bank of New York, and the US Treasury gave him the power to decide that customs reg- revenues could be paid not just in gold and silver but with notes from the Bank of New York and the Bank. The first bank of the United States is known as BYM and Mellon Citizens. It was founded by Alexander Helen, and its early stockholders included John Baker Church, made in 10 British, Alexander Baring, and Rothschilds and Sons Banks had acquired major stakes in the First Bank of the U.S., as well as the Bank of England. <laughs> and another first stockholders include Thomas M. Willing, who became the richest man in America. Willing served as president of the Bank of North America. James Jacob Meyer de Rothschild, 1792-1688, founded the family banquet Rothschild as French banking dynasty in 1812 in Paris. So, we've got Paris in 1812, we've got England in 1810, 1812. We got New York in um, 1818 and London 1818. New York in 1812. We got Italian in 1812. Mayor Armstrong Rothschild had his eldest son remain in Frankfurt, where his four other sons were sent to different European cities to establish a financial institution to invest in business and provide banking service. Etymi within the family was a central part of the Rothschild strategy in order to assure control over their wealth remained in family hands. <laughs> Yeah, um, I I just can't believe people did not put two and two together and, and see what was going on back then. Like, how could you not see? I, I suppose people had no communication methods that, you know, could have been why, but... George Peabody, 1795-1869, was American financier and philanthropist. Peabody went into business, dry goods later into banking... In 1837, he moved to London, where he became the most noted American banker and helped establish the Young's 
country's international credit. He had no sons of his own who could just pass on his business. Peabody took the Jupiter Spencer Morgan as partner in 1854 and their joint business would go on to become J.P. Morgan & Co. Wow, okay. <clears throat> so that's who the, the, the co are with J.P. Morgan. It's Peabody uh, and Julius Spencer. After Peabody's 1864 retirement and 1837, Peabody took up residence in London and then following the year, he started banking business trading on his own account. Banking firm George Peabody and Company was established in 1851 and was founded to meet the increasing da demand for securities issued by the American Railways. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, carve up America. So, yeah, I think Alan would like this one. Um, Although Peabody continued to deal in dry goods and other commodities, he increasingly focused his attentions to merchant banking, specialised in financing governments and large companies. The bank rose to become a premier American house in London, Peabody, Morgan & Co. Then took the name J.S. Morgan & Co., the former mer UK merchant bank Morgan Grenfell, now part of the George J. Bank, International Universal Bank, J.P. Morgan & Chase, and Investment Bank Morgan Stanley can all trace their roots to Peabody's Bank. There you go. Now you know. Upon Peabody's retirement in 1864, control was assumed by Morgan, who had joined the firm as a partner in 1854. The firm was renamed J.S. Morgan & Co., and the firm's New York agency was later to become J.P. Morgan & Co. Under the leadership of Junius's son, John Pierre Morgan, on the death of Junius in 1890, Pierpoint became the senior partner of the London firm. By 1910, all the firm's Morgan family partners were residents of the U.S. and reflected this in the London partnership was restructured with J.P. Morgan & Co., in the U.S. assuming 50% ownership of the London business, <laughs> which was reconstructed as Morgan, Grenfell & Co. in recognition of the senior London-based partner, Edward Grenfell. J.P. Morgan, Chase & Co. is now American multinational investment bank and financial services holding company headquartered in New York City. As of 2021, J.P. Morgan & Chase is the, the largest bank in the United States, the world's largest bank by market capitalization, and the fifth largest bank in the world in terms of total assets, with total assets totaling $3.831 trillion. The Warburg family founded M.M. Warburg & Co. in 1798, which makes it one of the oldest investment banks in existence. It was founded in 1798 by Barker Levy Karner of Warburg and brothers Moses Marcus Warburg of Garson Warburg. The Warburg family still owned the bank, continuing for more than 200 years of private bank ownership. Sigmund George Warburg joins James' cousin, founded the investment bank S.G. Warburg & Co. in London in 1946, which later became UBS Warburg. Paul Warburg Wahlberg was a director of Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is currently one of the four largest banks in the United States, along with the Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase. Paul Wahlberg, father of James Wahlberg, was one of the founders of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, which still controls the American economy to this day. James Wahlberg's uncle, Max Wahlberg, was among the main financiers of Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution, along with another powerful bank, Jacob Shift. Now, that's the Illuminati ones. So the Manhattan Company in 1799 is today known as J.P. Morgan and Chase and is promoted by Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. It was invested by John Baker Church, who became the director of Hamilton's behest. The founders of the Manhattan Bank, Aaron Burr and John Baker Church, fought on a duel the very day of the founding of the bank. No one was hit, so they reconciled. Brown Brothers and Co., 1818, it's today as the Brown Brothers and Harry and Co. Now, we've got that date, 1818, 1820, 1812. Like, are they finding stuff and, you know, creating a bank or, you know, big disaster and something's going on. So, the largest and oldest private investment banks in the United States, 1931, the merger of Brown Brothers and Co. founded in 1880 and Harry Brothers and Co. formed the current BBH after immigrating to Baltimore in the 1800s and building successful lean mercantile trading business. Alex Brown and his four sons co-founded Alex Brown and Sons in 1880. One son, John Alexander Brown, travelled to Philadelphia to establish a John A. Brown & Co. In 1825, another son, James Brown, established Brown Brothers & Co. on Pine Street in Lower Manhattan and Lake Case to, to Wall Street in 1833. This firm eventually acquired all the other Brown branches with another son, William Brown, had established William Brown & Co. in England in 1810, which was renamed Brown, Shipley & Co. In 1839, it became a separate entity in 1980. On January 2nd, 1931, Brown Brothers merged to the two other business entities, Harriman Brothers and Company, a private bank started with railway money, owned W.A. Harriman & Co. to form Brown Brothers and Harriman & Co. Founding partners included Prescott E. Bush, E. Ronald Harriman, and 
W. Erwell Harriman. In the 1930s, the company acted as the U.S. base for the German industrialist Fritz Thurston, who helped finance out Adolf Hitler. Later, Prescott Bush would become one of the seven directors of the Union Banking Corporation in the U.S., whose assets were seized by the United States government on October the 20th, 1942, during World War II, under the U.S. Trading with the Enemy Act. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Marcus Goldman, 1821 to 1904, was an American investment banker, businessman, financer, who was born to an Ashkenazi Jewish family in Trapezart, Germany, immigrated into the United States in 1848, was a, his paternal father called Jonathan Marx, until he changed his name to Goldman when Jews were allowed to have surnames in 1811. While attending classes at the synagogue in Warburg, he met Joseph Sachs, who would become his lifelong friend. Goldman immigrated into the United States from Frankfurt, Maine, Germany, in 1848. Upon his arrival in America, his name was changed to Marcus Goldman by immigrate, U.S. immigration. He was the founder of Goldman Sachs, which has since become one of the largest, world's largest investment banks. Marcus Goldman founded the Goldman Sachs in New York City in 1869. In 1882, Goldman's son-in-law, Samuel Sachs, joined the firm. In 1885, Goldman took his son Henry and son-in-law Ludwig Dreyfus into the business and the firm adopted its present name, Goldman Sachs & Co. The company has been criticised for a lack of ethical standards, working director, dictatorial regimes, cosy relationships with the US federal government via a revolving door of former employees and driving up prices of commodities through the future speculations to mention a few hundreds of cases of corruption. Yeah. Sol Solomon Loeb, 1828-1903, was a German-born American banker and businessman. He was a mercantile in textiles and a banker with Con Lob and Co. John Pierpont Morgan, eighteen thirty seven to nineteen thirteen, was a Wall Street was an American financier and investment banker who dominated corporate finance on Wall Street throughout the Gilded Age as the head of banking firm that ultimately became known as JP Morgan and Co. He was a driving force behind the wave of industrial consolidation in the US. Over the course of his career on Wall Street, JP Morgan Morgan spearheaded the formation of several prominent multinational corporations, including US Steel, Internal Harvester and General Electric. He and his partners also had controlling interests in numerous other American businesses, including Atia, Western Union, Pullman Car Company, and 21 Railways. His son, J.P. Morgan Jr., took over the business before at his father's death, but he was never as influential. As required by the 1933 Glass-Degel Act, the House of Morgan became three entities, J.P. Morgan & Co., which later became Morgan Grantry Trust, Morgan Stanley, and an investment house formed by his grandson, Henry Sturgis Morgan, Morgan Grenfell in London, and an overseas securities house. I didn't know about that. Joe John Davison Rockefeller Sr., 1839 to 1937, was an American businessman and philanthropist, and he was widely considered the wealthiest American of all time, richest person in modern history. Rockefeller founded the oil Standard Oil Company in 1870. He ran it until 1897 and remained its largest shareholder. Rockefeller's wealth soared as kerosene and gasoline grew in importance. He quickly became the richest person in the country, controlling 90% of the oil in the United States at its peak. This was typical of the robber barons who were given monopolies by the federal government. Jacob Henry Schiff in 1847 and 1920 was an American banker, this man philanthropist who helped finance, among other, many other things, the Japanese military efforts against the Tassaro uh, Russia Tsar in the Japanese-Russian War. James Love was a German-born American banker, Hellenist, and a philanthropist, 1867 to 1933. Paul Morberg, Mortez Warburg, 1868 to 1932, was a German-American board banker who was an early advocate of the U.S. Federal Reserve System. Amato Gianni, 1879 and founded the Bank of Italy in San Francisco, California. In 1904, it grew by the banking branch banking strategy, become Bank of America, the world's largest commercial bank. Bank of Italy merged with the smaller Bank of Los Angeles during the 1928. In 1930, Gianni changed the name to Bank of Italy to Bank of America. As the chairman knew the larger Bank of America, Gianni explained, explained, expanded the bank throughout his tenure, which control, continued until his death in 1949. The Bank of America merged with Nations Bank of Charlotte, North Carolina in 1998. Felix Moritz Warburg, 1871 to 1937, was a German-born American banker. He was a member of the Warburg banking family of Hamburg, Germany. Mortimer Leib Schiff, 1877 to 1931, was American banker, notable early Boy Scouts of America leader. His son John Mortimer Schiff, also involved with the BSA. James Paul Warburg, 18 96 to 1969, German-born American banker, well known for being the financial advisor to Franklin Roosevelt. His father was banking Paul Warburg, member of the Warburg family who helped fund the U.S. Federal Reserve. <laughs> Sir Sigmund George Warburg, 1902 to 1982, was a German-born English banker who was a member of the prominent Warburg family, played a prominent role in the development of the Merchant Bank 
both of England and America. David Rockefeller, 1915 to 2017, was an American investment banker who served as a chairman and a chief executive in Chase Manhattan Corporation. He was the oldest living member of the third generation of the Rockefeller family, the family patriarch, from July 2004 until his death in March 2017. David was the fifth son of the youngest son, child of the John D. Rockefeller Jr. and L.B. Ulrich Rockefeller and the grandson of John D. Rockefeller. He was noted for his wide-ranging political connections and foreign travel in which he met many foreign leaders. His fortune was estimated at $3.3 billion at the time of his death in March 2017. The U.S. Federal Reserve System is central banking system of the United States of America enacted by the Federal Reserve Act of 1930. U.S. Congress established three key objectives for monetary policy of the U.S. of the Federal Reserve Act. Maximizing employment, stabilizing prices, and moderating long-term interest rates. Its duties have expanded over the years and currently also include supervising and reg regulating banks, maintaining the stability of the financial system, and providing financial services to depository institutions, the U.S. government, and the foreign official institutions. The Federal Reserve System is governed by the Presidentially Appointed Board of Governors, or the Federal Reserve Board. Twelve regional Federal Reserve banks located in the seas throughout the nation regulate and oversee privately owned commercial banks. Nationally chartered commercial banks are often required to hold stock in and collect some board members through the Ref Federal Reserve Bank of their region. The Federal Open Market Committee sits monetary policy through its seven members of the Board of Governors and the 12 regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents. The United States Department of Treasury, an entity outside of the central bank, prints the currency used. Although the instrument of the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve System considers itself an independent central bank because its monetary policy decisions do not have to be approved by the president or anyone else in the executive or legislative branches of government. It does not receive funding appropriated by Congress, and the terms of members of the board of the government span multiple presidential and Congress terms. The Bank of International Settlements was founded in 1930 and is owned by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Bank of England, Bank of Italy, Bank of Canada, Swiss Bank, Nishidori Bank, Bundesberg Bank, Bank of France, BIS, is the most powerful bank in the world and is a global central bank for the banking of families who control private central banks and, most of all, Western development agents. The first president of the BIS was Rockefeller banker Gates McGrath, an official at Chase Manhattan at the Federal Reserve. The U.S. government had a historical distrust of the BIS, lobbying unsuccessfully for its demise in the 1944 post-World War II Bretton Woods Conference. Instead, the banking family's power was computed with the Bretton Woods creation of the IMF and the World Bank. The BIS holds at least 10% of monetary reserves for at least 8% of the world's central banks, the IMF, and other multinational institutions. It serves as a financial agent for the international agreements, collectives, information on the global economy, and serves as a leader of the last resort. It serves as a financial agent for international agreements, collects imp information on the global economy, and serves as a lender of last resort to prevent global financial collapse. The BIS promotes the agenda of monopoly capitalism, fascism. It serves as a conduct conduit for the banking families who funded Adolf Hitler. This effort was led by the Warburgs J. Henry Schroeder, Melchior Bank of Amsterdam. In 1944, the first World Bank bonds were floated by Morgan Stanley, the first Boston which helped support the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Economic Forum. The World Bank is an international financial institution that provides loans and grants to the governments of low- and middle-income countries for the purpose of pro capital projects. The World Bank is a collective name for international Bank of Reconstruction and Development and the International Development Association, two of the five international organisations owned by the World Bank. It was established along with the International Monetary Fund at the 1948 Fall Bretton Woods Conference, along with the International Money Fund. The president of the World Bank, traditionally America, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are both based in Washington, D.C. and work closely with each other. Although many countries were represented at Bretton Woods Conference, the United States and the United Kingdom were the most powerful in attendance and dominated the negotiations. <laughs> it's because we know who they are. We know what they are, but we just did not say they did, what they are, what they, who they are. Republic of Venice, Central Bank Model. The Central Banking System of Venice has committed 10... On the, had a committee of ten who oversaw the Republic, while in a subset on that committee was a committee of the three. Who had the power to order the death of anyone who might be harming the Republic, the city-state of Venice. The power of death was given to the bankers, as well as the power of imprisoned people who did not repay the loans on time. Debtors, prison and bankers become powerful forces in the lives of those who used them. And as time wore on, bankers entered into every aspect of personal and civic life. Bankers came to control, not only land and money, but also become civil and political powerhouses who control life and death circumstances. Eventually, banking becomes synonymous with corruption, evil subterfuge, propaganda, espionage, war, dominant practice, and punitive laws. <laughs> well, what do you expect when you have an idol? 
Looking objectively at the history of money, banking, and its exploration of the worship of anti-human forces that have created some of the worst pages in history, this is why we use the derogatory term banksters as an indication of these banksters, economic gangsters, who will be not hesitate to kill through war, starvation, and economic slavery. The Venetians forgot what King Hambre learned when he made laws concerning the period of periodic forgiveness of loans because generally the common person could not pay back the debt and the interest on the loan. Therefore, necessitating jail, necessitating time in the debtor's prison where loans default, where usury filled up Hamburg's jails, he learned to grant loan forgiveness celebration every three years. The Hebrews called it the year of the Jubilee and forgave all loans made to other Hebrews every seven years. The lesson learned is the same as 4,000 years ago. Usury doesn't work. And that's still active today. Every seven years, your debts get wiped. British banksters, the oligarchical banking system of the Great Britain represents the refined model of the traditions of the Babylonians, Romans, Byzantines and the Venetians, who have been transplanted into the British Isles through a series of upheavals in the 16th and 17th century. The evil of the Venetian Memon worship invaded England and Scotland through the Venetian oligarchy and the philosophy and political forms, family fortunes, imperial geopoliticals. The victory of the Venetian party in England between 1509 and 1715 built upon the Byzantine and the Venetian Banking Foundation. Venetian ol oligarchs were a guiding force among the Lombardy bankers who carried out the great shearing of England, which led to the bankruptcy of King Henry III, who, during the 1250s, repudiated his debts and went bankrupt. The bankruptcy was followed by a large-scale civil war. This was under Venetian, I suppose, that England had started a, a, a catastrophic conflict against France, known today as the Hundred Year War. In 1314-40, King Edward III of England sent an embassy to Dodge Girono announcing his intention to wage war on France for proposing an Anglo-Venetian alliance. Grado Deo accepted Edward III's offers that all Venetians on English soil would receive the same privileges and immunity enjoyed by Englishmen. The Venetians accepted the privilege and declined to join the fighting. Henry suppression of the oligarchs despised Venice. Venetians wanted England to become embroiled with both France and Spain. Venice was also fundamentally hostile to the modern nation state, which Henry was promoting in England. When Henry's son turned out to be pro Venetian, the Venetians were able to assert their Henry was King of England between fifteen oh nine and fifteen forty seven. His ascension to the throne coincided with the outbreak of war of the League of Cambrai, in which most European states, including France, the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, Spain and the Papacy of Pope Julius II joined together in the combination of the tried to annihilate Venice and its oligarchy. Henry, alone among the major rulers of Europe, maintained the pro-Venetian position. Henry was for a time the former ally of Venice and Pope Julius. Can't you see they're circling the Roman Empire? They went to Russia up that way and they went down the other way. Can't you see it? 